my god, it's like shocking. Biggest, biggest news in out of Hollywood. Different, but just growing up, you know. I mean, it was it was hard. Oh, shit, is this what happens? Like, holy shit, that changed everything. You know, everything, everything. My whole life changed. Who's looking out for me? So I had to grow up very, very quickly. It's the reality of how I grew up and and what shaped me into the person that I am today. So. He pointed his drumstick at me from the stage, and I'm like, "Oh shit! That this is it. Like, it's gonna change. This is everything's gonna change. Where's life gonna go? I'm going to freaking America. I didn't even have to think about it. Like, there was no pros and cons. I'm freaking going, and I'm gonna make a life for myself. Like, all these massive arenas. So I go from living literally in Chantley Wood to now I'm flying around on private jets, and I literally, it's like you know, climbing a, a, a stairs one at a time learning 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 as you go along and that's what i did so before we start this podcast all right i'm gonna do a disclaimer to um anyone listening because this this um journey is um gonna bring up a lot well may bring up some things that may trigger a few people now it's an international call so we're going to have some information in the comments box for services that may be able to support you. But to start off with, we've got a person, right, who's had to really fight to um, survive. I mean, her story demonstrates that every, anything is possible and with hard work and determination. She's known as the gruesome girl with the brummy accent, well, historically known as that. Um, she's rubbed shoulders with some of the um, biggest names in um, boxing, such as um, Zab Judah, um, Wayne McCulloch, James Tony, and trainers um, such as um, Bunny, Buddy McGirt. Also, Freddie Roach and former boxer and boxing promoter Oscar De La Hoya. Now, she's also known as the first female to look after a Saudi Arabia boxer. And we're going to talk about that in more detail as, as we um, go through this, this episode. Life's not always been sweet and, and dandy for, the, for this individual. And as we do it in Fine Star, this is upfront discussions. And we're going to talk about a journey of such an amazing lady. When I saw the Instagram and I saw some of the things that she was up to, I, I, you know, it inspired me. But if you don't know who I'm talking about, in fact, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. So to the world, if no, if if um, anyone don't know you, who are you and what do you do? Okay, well, first of all, the introduction was lovely, so I'm, my mascara is probably gonna start to run. But uh, I'm Rachel Charles, and I'm uh, a proud Brummy, now living in Los Angeles, proud uh, proud girl from Charmsley Wood. And uh, yeah, that's who I am. I, I'm a, publis, pub, a publicist and a manager in, in uh, professional boxing. Oh. Been around a long time. And Charmsley Wood. Charmsley Wood's kind of like close to me because I used to work in Charmsley Wood. But why this story is so inspiring, it, it definitely demonstrates that anything is possible. A lady, a, you know, a woman from Charmsley Wood, all the way now in Hollywood, living the life, that a lot of people would dream, dream of. But I also want to emphasize that, you know, that journey wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy journey. And we're going to dig deep into, you know, this wonderful journey throughout today's episode. But before we start, how are you, Rachel? How, how are you? How's life treating you? Life is good. Thank you very much. Life is good. I was busy. Um, I had a fight last week. Um, and we won. So that was uh, a typical fight week is always busy. You know, every day is busy. So that was good. And just been in, in and out of the gym and waiting for the next fight dates to come up for my for my boys. And then, you know, getting uh, getting my own road work in every morning, doing my thing, you know. So yeah. um, typical life in <laughs> L.A. It's great. Except, you know, it's 100 degrees outside. Well, it's, it's been <laughs> raining that over is here. Typical. It's, it's I heard. Raining. Oh God, we could raining. do with some of that. <laughs> That's funny. And you've been celebrating as well. I heard that there's been a wedding in the camp. Yes. 
Oh my God, it's like shocking. Biggest, biggest news in, out of Hollywood this week was uh, Freddie Roach married his, uh, literally his best friend, M Marie. Everyone, if, if you know boxing, you know Freddie, you know the wildcard gym, you all know Marie. And they've been uh, best friends um, for ever and ever and ever. And, um, you know, they they decided to get married after all these years. So yeah. she she says, she asked me to come to a, to the gym and I thought I was going for a meeting. Yeah. And then uh, she told me the night before, actually, it's a wedding. I'm like, holy shit, like, this is great. So it was wonderful. Great surprise. Yeah. Very happy. So today, right, we're going to, we're going to go through um, your journey. But to, I always say to understand the person and to truly see where the fight comes from, it's important to touch on some of the key signific significant moments that, you know, an individual has, has gone through. So let's go back to life before Hollywood, before it all started. Let's take you right back to Chelmsley Wood. What was life like in Chelmsley Wood for you, a young Rachel Charles? Um, you know, I mean, I think I think anyone from a house and estate, I think there's, you know, everyone has something in common, right? There's always that house and estate kind of vibe. But I mean, I lived, I lived down at Aaron Way, Wheatfield Close, lived in the house with my mother and my siblings. Um, it was a little different. I was the only black kid in the house. Um, and, um, you know, we just, uh, I was just living, you know, like growing up just like everybody else, but, you know, obviously, um, we were, none of us were, two of my sisters are full biological sisters. And then my brother and I, we, so we're all kind of separate, but, you know, but me just being the only black kid in the house was definitely different, but just growing up, you know, I mean, it was, it was hard, you know, definitely there was definitely struggles and, you know, kid stuff, young kid stuff, and then adolescent stuff, teenage stuff. But it was, it was, um, sometimes it was fun and sometimes it wasn't fun. I mean, that's, that's, you know, if I'm going to be real, you know, we're keeping it real. It was uh, difficult sometimes, you know, but uh, yeah, I'll play with my friends and go play, you know, in the park and things like that. And go nick a packet of biscuits out of the shop. And, <laughs> you know, just, typical you know growing up but um but yeah but you know sometimes you know there were very dark days and um yeah it was uh it was a challenging childhood I would say I'd have to say and and you mentioned being the only um black child in the family home I mean what did you kind of like feel it growing up was it made known when you was growing up did you yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, it, it it didn't help when my two sisters could wash their hair and go out and play and their hair's all fluffy and lovely. And I'm sitting under a dryer with a dog brush <laughs> trying to comb my hair, right? So I was like, okay, something's not right. But um, yeah, you know, there was uh, this lady down the street and um she pointed out to me that, you know, that my my parents weren't my parents and that that kind of started the whole thing of them then having to tell me that I, I have a different father and I'm black. And so everything kind of fell into place after that, like things made sense. Um, so, and I was young, I was only like five when they told me, very young. Um, and uh, I think from that point on though, I lived my life differently, you know? Um, because I, I just felt then I, you know, I felt different. I was looking around. I'm like, well, there's no one that looks like me. We've got nothing really, you know, like what's my reference point of who who do I look like? I hadn't met my dad, my biological dad by that point yet. Um, so I just um I just kind of started to live my life as a as a different person. It was I, I went right to the black side immediately. Is it? Straight to the black side. I'm all the, I mean, I was like running. It didn't help that Roots came out. I'm like, oh shit, is this what happens? Like, holy shit. <laughs> this is not good, right? So, um, but nah, I just, you know what? I knew I was different. And um, yeah, I mean, it was everything about me was different to my siblings. You know what I mean? Just something as simple as my hair or, you know, being called a, or the derogatory names that we used to get called back in the day, um, just things like that. So yeah, I mean, it was like a, a, a daily thing. I was quite aware that I was the only black person in the house yeah. and there was one more black family in the street. So yeah, yeah. And, and what was it like in terms of 
now you're going into kind of like your teenage years and you know what it's like with, with, with teenagers growing up. What was the relationship with your, your, your mom and, and your stepfather as well growing up? What was that like? Well, my stepdad left um, when I was probably about maybe eight or nine. I think he left. So um, my mom, you know, uh, she had another boyfriend and he molested me. So that changed everything, you know, everything, everything, my whole life changed. Um, uh, so it, that was really, really hard. And, you know, my relationship with my mother was just like, whatever, you know, like you let me down, you've let, you know, you kind of, uh, you didn't protect me. You didn't look out for me. So that was a massive deal. Um, and of course you have to go to school and people know about it. Some people don't, and you're in the freaking Birmingham evening mail and, you know, neighbors talk and all that. So I had to live through that on every single day, which was horrible. The guy came back to live in the house after he got out of jail, which was even worse. So, you know, that was, uh, I was a prisoner in, like I felt like a prisoner in my own home. So of course I would lash out and be, you know, I was a, I was probably, if my mother had to say, I was a crappy kid, you know, like I was naughty, you know, yeah. um, but, uh, but I was in pain. You know what I mean? Like I was hurt and I had no, like who's looking out for me. So I had to grow up very, very quickly. And that happened at the age of 10. So I had to grow up instantly, like literally within that time frame of that crime being committed, I had to grow up and be a different person. So um, I just realized it's just, I'm on my own. Like there's nobody to look af after me, you know? So, um, and then, at the age of 16, I got pregnant and had my daughter at 17. Yeah. So, you know, it was just one, one thing after another, like there was never a time when it was just like, not necessarily skipping down the street, have, you know, but there was always like a cloud. There was always this black cloud above, mm -hmm. you know, just not far from, you know, if I was happy, sadness was not far behind. Not far behind. Um, and it's always been that way, even now at the, at the age that I'm at. But um, so, yeah, it was a struggle, you know, so I'm, I'm dealing with being I don't know who my dad is, um, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with this this awful crime being committed. I've got my mother who's sitting there doing God. I don't even know what the hell was going on in her mind. You know, I, mean, I, I wasn't in her mind. She was she was a young woman with four kids. So whatever. Um, but, um, you know, and I'm black and I've got all this th all these things to deal with at the you know, such a young age. I hadn't even hit my teens before all these major things that happened in my life that typically happen to people perhaps later in life, you know, big, you know, earth shattering type um, experiences or situations. And I had to deal with it before, you know, before I was even 11 years of age. Yeah. So it's pretty rough. And I, and I can't even imagine, even, even start to imagine the feelings and, and the things that you was going through. And also as well, before I touch on the next kind of like area, I mean, for, for, for young people at that age as well, things like abandonment um, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, people either walking into your life or walking out of your life. As Sometimes as parents, we don't realise the impact it has on, on people. Yeah. What I want to ask you is when was the first time you felt that kind of like abandonment and, and, and loss in terms of somebody significant walking away out of your life? I think when my stepdad left, because he was my dad up until I knew that he wasn't. And I think that, you know, when I knew that he wasn't, I saw him as like he wasn't type of, you know, like you, you're not my dad and you're a white guy. So you're definitely not my dad. But I think when he left, it, um, he, he married an, another lady and, uh, you know, there was four kids in the house. Two, he had two biological girls with my mom. But his new wife said, you've got two kids, not four. So he had to make a decision and leave myself and my brother behind and had a relationship, of course, with his daughters. So I'm sitting there going, but that's my dad. You know, that's my dad as well. Like, so where's my dad? Like, you know, and I think right then and now it was like, you know, I, I don't have a dad. And then my dad's 6,000 miles away living in Los Angeles, but I don't know him. I don't know. I've never met him, you know, uh, so I, I didn't have anyone really. So 
it was um it's that it's that stereotype of kind of sitting on the step and you're waiting for someone to come pick you up and they don't show up you know but that's that's just how it is in life you know what I mean all the when you're going through something in life you're looking for someone and they're not there and, and so in my case it was my my parents you know I mean you know I'm not really trying to necessarily drag my mother through the hedge right now but it's the reality of how I grew up and and what shaped me into the person that I am today so mm. you know um it would definitely be my dad and then of course my stepdad and then of course my mother not looking after me the way that you know she should have um that that was the biggest I think coming into that when I came home from school one day and the, this, the guy that had offended in the house was back in the house that's like oh my god that's like the 1979 version of get out like, <laughs> like you know like what do you do right you, it's uh yeah and you're you're a kid so it's like shut up go sit down and you know like life is going to go on but that's just not how it works mm. you know it's not you're living in fear every single day you mm. can't move around you can't do things in the house that you wouldn't you would normally do you can't do anything because now you're feeling self-conscious I can't be in the room with this guy is he gonna grab me again or do whatever or, you know, like, I, I didn't even know how to handle myself. I didn't know what to do. Mm. And I there was no guidance. There was no um, follow-up care, no nothing. So, yeah, mm. it was it was, uh, it was was really tricky. Finally, he left, you know, so. So imagine, I imagine that in terms of the survival skills, and those are some of the things that we'll touch on as, as we discuss in it. But I imagine some of those survival skills that you had to really learn as you was going on and and build up your own survival skills for yourself yeah 100 percent, absolutely it doesn't come come with a rule book you know things like that even like sexual sexual assaults and things like that they don't come with any kind of a rule book of how you're you know what do you do you know um so i had to learn yeah definitely how to protect myself how to just you know stay guarded and because i was absolutely on my own I was in a house full of there was a, what uh, five six of us and but I felt like I was in there on my own and uh, it was very very hard and I had to learn very very quickly yeah. so yeah yeah and and now that you you know at the time you mentioned that you you went on and, and had your own daughter do you think that um you was became overprotective as well of your daughter and in terms of like the surroundings or who was around her what impact did that have on you when you you know I I don't think I was the best mom to be honest with you you know um I think that I had a so young I was I was only out of school I'd only left um high school a year before uh I was very very young you know um and uh I didn't know how to be a mother like like you know a typical teenage girl having a kid and uh you know I could have had an abortion and but I was like oh I want to go to mother care and you know it's like that like who thinks of that you know like I'm thinking oh the stroller's really cute and everyone's having a baby and you know and it's, it's that's such a sad thing to to be thinking about but that's kind of where my head was and um but I wasn't the greatest mom you know I was still living on Chantley Wood I was living in a masonette I was on the social rubbing my 50 pence meter every time I, it, I shook it and it felt full, you know, I'd crack it and open it and spend the money, um, you know, just dodging and weaving through teenage life and, and being a mom. I don't think I was the best mom. It just wasn't, um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't good, you know, yeah. definitely wasn't good. So I, you know, it, yeah, it wasn't good. And, no. and then in terms of now you've, you've, because the journey now to to rebuilding your life and and you know moving now towards where you are at this present point because you've got a special relationship with that that song sweet caroline i do but before we go into that special relationship you met someone that pretty much changed the course of the direction of your journey and 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 this is why you know I always say to people that you meet people for a reason you meet people for a season and people for mm -hmm. a lifetime but the person that you met absolutely 
360 turn and your life started to go into a different direction yeah who was that person and how did you meet this individual so that person was Vince Charles um my husband uh well former husband um Vince Charles was the percussionist for Neil Diamond um my uncle is also a percussionist for Neil Diamond they're both they were both permanent members of the band so every time my uncle would when Neil would come to play in concert in England and um, they would always come to Birmingham of course so I would go to see my uncle and Vince um would also be there and they happened to come over one year and I was 21 by that point and uh Vince and I hit it off and uh yeah he you know he just was he he says come to america come come and come and live in america we went to the concert that, on that night yeah. he pointed his drumstick at me from the stage and i'm like oh shit that this is it like it's gonna change this is everything's gonna change and uh yeah that's what that's what we did we corresponded for a couple of months and um i came over in august of 1990 and mm. i met up with him in november of 89 so mm. yeah and I came I came over very quickly um and we got married a few months later and that was it I was I was living in America me and my daughter what was it like though that move because to do something like that you've got to be a, a fearless person you gotta and be a ballsy why, bitch right uh, you've got to, and, and, <laughs> but this is why I always say to understand the person you have to understand their history Right. Yeah. And that fight and, you know, all those inner empowerment is something yeah. that you would have used to make that decision. Yeah. You, you know what? I'll tell you what, look, I'm not even going to lie. This this guy, he was a great guy. I mean, if anyone, you know, anyone watching this, when you watch it, Google him, you'll see it's a, a great talent, talented musician. It was from St. Kitts. Great guy. But, uh, you know, he asked me to come over. I stood there, looked in my apartment and I'm like, OK. I'm living in a dump. I'm on the social. I've got that, like, I'm circling the drain. Where's life gonna go? I'm going to freaking America. I didn't even have to think about it. Like, there was no pros and cons. I'm freaking going and I'm gonna make a life for myself. And that's what I did. And he offered me this life. He offered me a chance in life, you know, that nobody else had ever offered me. Everyone else that I'd ever ha hung out with, you know, what was just like crappy you know bs i don't know if we can swear on this thing i don't want to swear course, <laughs> but I, I got a dirty mouth but anyway um you know he offered me a whole life but it, more importantly he offered it was a life for my daughter she didn't have to grow up on charms the wood like i did now we have an option and i took it and i and i did not look back i swear to god i flipped everybody off and that was it i was gone I literally, I, I rubbed my meter so I could go uptown and buy some clothes. Remember the um, Oasis Market? Oasis Market is still there, you know. Is it? Oh, God. So, yeah, I went up there and I, I remember buying a few pieces of clothing. And there used to be a store and I forget what it was called, but I think like everything in there was like under £10 or something. I don't remember what it was called. I think it was like way before Primark and all that. I don't even know what, what store this was. But anyway, needless to say, it was in the ball ring. But I went up there, got some stuff. And uh, yeah, got on a plane and that was it. I, I, I swear to God, I didn't look back. I'm like, I'm gone. I signed my, my social book over to my mother and uh, took off. And that was it. And, and you started touring because you, you was on that touring life. Tour, what was touring like with um, the group? That was fun. It was, it was really cool, actually. You know, I mean, you know, Vince was... 22 years older than me. So everyone around me was older. Um, and, um, but it was a lot of fun. You know, we played Madison Square Garden. We played like all these massive arenas. So I go from living literally in Chantley Wood to now I'm flying around on private jets and the whole band. And if you ever see the movie, uh, Almost Famous, yeah. it's kind of like that. There's a lot of, a lot of hot smoking, a lot of drinking. I don't drink, I don't smoke. So I was, you know, completely out of all of that my husband Vince would say oh we're going to go sit in the black of the bus so they'd be in the back smoking and getting high and I'd be up front but um and then you know we'd uh, go play all these big big towns all over America and stuff and um it was really really cool and I'd be in the audience and 
you know, we're all dancing and having a good time and uh, watching Vince do what he does on stage was fantastic. And I mean, it was just, uh, it's like a Cinderella story. You know, someone picked up that, that shoe and that was it, I was gone. And, you know, I mean, I was homesick, but I'm like, I'm not that freaking homesick. I, I could, this is good. I was swimming pool in my back garden. Like when I got here, I go right in the back and there's a freaking swimming pool. I'm like, you shit me. I used to have to go to Charles with swimming baths. You know, I'm not be freezing on the bus on the way down or whatever. But now there's, I've got a pool in my back garden. That was, that blew my mind. And that I could go to the store and not have to steal deodorant because I was so broke. And now I'm rich. I was like, oh shit, I can buy cheese and deodorant and whatever else I want to buy I got some money but it was great you know I mean we had a good time and, and again I mean I'm just I would just sit there and have to pinch myself because you know I keep going back I'm a girl from Charmsley Wood and I got scooped up and plopped right in the middle of Hollywood it was fantastic and when did that all come to an end in terms of like the touring life and because you've mentioned you know, it was it was crazy time and, and some of the drinking and so forth. When did it start taking a, a turn of direction? You know, I think once I started, once my daughter, uh, her name's Georgia, once Georgia started to go to school and make friends and stuff like that, I stopped traveling. And to be honest, I was bored of it. I'd, I'd made my own friends as well. And Vince and I didn't really have a great relationship, you know, because he was unfortunately an alcoholic. And I didn't understand alcoholism and, and, you know, lifestyle of a rock and roller. And that's pretty much what he, he, how he lived. Um, but once my daughter was going to school and we kind of settled in, I stopped touring and just let them go out. You know, he would go off and do his own thing and he'd be gone for a couple of months, come back, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever, and then go again. So at that time, Neil was on his like third life, almost. He was, skyrocket you know high massive massive mega mega um star so they were off doing their own thing and I was just kind of like starting to figure out my what I was going to do over here and Georgia was at school and all that so that it was pretty I'd say about two years in I'd stopped going on the road yeah Yeah. I was pretty much over it I I couldn't hear Sweet Caroline another night I was like holy my ears are gonna freaking my eyes are bleeding I had like full-on stigmata I'm like holy shit I can't listen to this again I gotta get out of here but um no I just you know I just um I just started making a life for myself you know I had friends by then so I didn't really need to be around him so much you know so Mm. and and I was still very young I was like 20 23 24 I was very young yeah you know how ironic is that, though? Because as you mentioned, you, you got sick of hearing that song, Sweet Caroline. <laughs> and now, I mean, we, we're going to go into the boxing at some right. point. But that is the anthem for Unbelievable. Boxing. So you can't get away from it. <laughs> I can't. And you know what? It's, so, it's crazy because when I very first, the first time I heard it in boxing, I, I must have been in the other room and I was waiting for a, um, the fight to come on TV. And I, and I hear the first couple of bars and I'm like, what the heck? And then I look, I'm like, oh, are you shitting me? Like you're playing freaking sweet Caroline. And then everyone's, but when you're in a massive stadium, it actually looks good, sounds good. And it feels good, right? It's, it's a feel good song. For me, I'm like, oh my God, like, no, why? 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 Yeah. <laughs> like, give me a break, you know, but I do. I have to think about Vince, of course, every time I hear it. I mean, yeah. it's just like, okay, he's at work with me, you know, but uh, I've been I've been in a couple of stadiums personally and heard it, you know. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, my phone blows up. Oh, Rachel, they're playing Vince's song. I'm like, oh, for God's sake. You know, it's like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting. It's it's bittersweet, I should say, you know. I yeah. mean, really, I should, I kind of sound a little ungrateful, but I'm really not ungrateful, but I mean, I'm really after listening to it for all that time, you just yeah. don't want to hear it again, you know, but, um, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's great, you know, but uh, yeah, it's interesting. Can't believe it's become the, the anthem of the fight yes. game. That's nuts. Football's taking it over now. The, the, um, oh, the, the, the female football team was playing it a lot when they won the Euros and, and that was playing. I, I, I kind of chuckled after <sighs> we had our last conversation right? because it, it, it's seeping over into all kinds of sports. It is. You know what? It's incredible. You know, I mean, the royalties alone after that must be astronomical. 
yeah. you know but it just goes to show like wholesome good fun music it never dies yeah. no one's going to be playing all this stuff that we're hearing today in a hundred years from now it's not going to be played you know yeah. sweet caroline is more than likely going to be played for my great great grandkids somewhere down the line right it's like oh god but yeah it's just one of those songs that sticks in your ears and then you listen you hear it all day long you know after that but it's all right it's cool and employment now you, you've stopped touring mm -hmm. we're going to talk about some of the employment because you weren't always in boxing so what are Correct. some of the things that you had to do to really survive now or bring your own income coming in yeah so you know after um after vince and i broke up um you know i found myself once again in the country, my dad lives down the street, but I don't, I, I don't have a relationship with my dad. And at the time it was super rocky anyway. So we, I knew that there was gonna be no, um, you know, support, not financial, but just like, you know, no support from him um, at that time. And my daughter was still, you know, young. Um, so I was now I'm faced with having to leave my house, uh, get an apartment, get a job and get on with living. And at this time, I'm only like 27, maybe 28, something like, again, still very young. Um, and um, I actually went and got a job at the mall because I thought, well, what am I going to do? I didn't go to college. I think I went to So Little Tech for like two weeks because I was on what a training it? scheme. I got paid like 25, 25 pounds a week, I think, if you went on a training scheme. So I went down there and then that was it, you know. So, but, so I had no education, had no formal, you know, higher education, I should say. So I was like, well, what am I going to do? So I just went to the mall and I got a job at the, the store that I used to shop at all the time where my friends worked and I was in retail. So I was like, okay, well, at least I've got a job, you know, I've got a bit of money coming in. And then after that, I just got a better job and a better job and a better job. But my personality, you know, I met a lot of people and a lot of people really kind of warmed to me and liked me. So I was able to you know, really kind of uh, take advantage of, of the people that I was meeting um, along the way. And it just helped me just kind of hop, hop, skip to literally, I ended up working in Beverly Hills for one of the biggest advertising agencies in the world. Yeah. My boss was, um, his name was Tony Seiniger, and he um, uh, came up with the concept of the Jaws poster. So okay. I ended up working, yeah, he, we did like, movies trailers posters you name it this man did it it was the best ad agency in the world and I worked for him as his assistant and it was fantastic but you know I wouldn't have got there if I hadn't have been working at Nordstrom's because that's how I met his wife and she took me to meet her husband in Beverly Hills so you know now I'm driving to Beverly Hills every day my little you know Ford Escort car got my driver's license and and uh, so, I, and then I took that job and just, I just literally kept going from better to better to better to better and just learning as I went along and figuring out, okay, it's my person that like, what is, what's, what's going on with me? I don't, I don't have a high school diploma or whatever, you know, I don't have anything that the Americans will look at when they go to employ you. So what is it that I have? that's going to get me, you know, what's going on with me? What's this common thread? And it was just, just my personality. And I've just been so lucky that um, I get along with folks and uh, they, they just saw something in me. Everyone I've ever met saw something in me that they helped me, you know, fine tune. And it just got me to the next level. I literally, it's like, you know, climbing the a, a, a stairs one at a time, learning, mm. learning, learning, learning as you go along. And that's what I did, literally. Yeah.